If this is true, then our country is in a lot of trouble. We would have these trips, these special trips. But he said, my, my daddy takes the bodies to the grocery store and he grinds them up and puts it in the hamburger. And nobody ever knows it. How can kids, six, eight, ten years old, be describing rituals that come from a book like the, like the Book of the Dead? It's hard to get your mind around people being capable of this kind of evil. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up, rise up, rise up. Good evening, everybody, and welcome once again to the Midnight Ride. My name is David Carrico, and it is my great honor once again to welcome you to the Midnight Ride. Tonight, apocalyptic pole shift when the mountains are removed. This is a big, big topic for a big, big broadcast. This could be bigger than moose and squirrel. So frostbite falls Eat your heart out because we are now live, live, live. What is up, Midnight Riders from all over the world? Tell us where you're from in the chat, or if you're watching this after it's live, tell us where you're at in the comment section. We always love to hear that. It always brings joy to see people all over the world uh, enjoying uh, what's going on uh, with this and, and just really seeking the truth and looking into things that isn't common, you know. And this is a perfect example tonight. This is a uh, it's going to be interesting to say at least. How have you been, David? Well, just fantastic. Uh, just so many good things are happening. And uh, this is a classic midnight ride topic. We're going to be really um, peeling back some ancient mysteries and uh, looking at what the Word of God has to say. And as always, the Word of God has amazing things to say about these deep mysteries. And a lot of times they're not so deep as you would think, and that is a little bit of a pun on what we'll be talking about. This it, it sure enough is, man, and it's enough. And you know, the, this the beautiful thing about this topic tonight is that the scripture talks about this, science talks about this. There's evidence of this all over the world, and and to be able to just approach this in in an ancient way to see these. I mean, we're going to be looking at things like maps of these ancient sea kings, these these amazing looking. Uh, maps that just show a whole different perspective than what we've been taught or been used to to seeing so uh, before we get started though i do want to thank our sponsors tonight cascadia cutlery who uh, they have some of the best manufactured knives and for those of you that know menu know knives if you look on their website you'll see what i'm talking about some of their knives have 
lifetime warranties. We're talking brands like Benchmade, also custom knives from some of the best knife makers in the United States and, and abroad are, are available on there. And they sponsor us. There's a, a package deal that they offer to our listeners. And so go check that out. Also, Joshua Watts Leather Company, which has been sponsoring us for a long time now. He's our longest running sponsor. It's been over over a year, maybe two over two years. And he's done a lot of work for a lot of you guys that listen, a lot of work for us. And we're super thankful for our sponsors. The links are in the description. And with that being said, are you guys ready? It is time to start the Midnight Ride. David, take us on the ride. All righty. And... As always, want to welcome each and every one of you to the Midnight Ride this evening. And we're going to begin in the Word of God, Revelation chapter 6 and verse 4. All right, thank you. And as we do here, unless we have something that is an obvious metaphor, symbolism, or allegory, uh, you can determine that in the text. We want to take the Bible for just what it says, and you'll come to truth that way. Revelation 6, 14, And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. Now, this is a future pole shift that we're looking uh, at here in Revelation 6.14, and it says very plainly, every mountain and island were moved. And we're going to be talking tonight about crust shift and the actual shifting of the crust of the earth and of pole shift. We're going to be applying this scientific theory, and of course there's problems with that. The geological tables are just a bunch of porkies, as is the whole uh, heliocentric spinning ball concept. So we've got to realign and rethink the scientific evidence, and then we're going to, as we always do, take it back to the Word of God, and it's going to be amazing some of the conclusions that we're going to come to. So there really is a reality that in the future, mountains will move. It will be the shifting of the earth's crust, a pole shift, and we're going to see that this has happened before. We're going to see it in science and in scripture. Now, one of the scholars that we're going to draw on uh, several times during the broadcast is Charles Hapgood. This guy was just an off-the-chart brainiac, and uh, we have three of his books in our library, Earth Shifting Crust, Path of the Pole, and the Maps of the Ancient Sea Kings. And we'll be referring to all three of those throughout the broadcast. He was a friend of Albert Einstein's, and uh, the guy was an out-of-the-box thinker. Now, we're going to have a midnight ride demonstration here, and I want to read from uh, his book, The Earth Shifting Crust, on page 388. And I want to explain to you what we're talking about when we talk about the crust shift. He says here on page 388, and this is so simple, you know, you can listen to Neil deGrasse Tyson and these guys blow <laughs> blow hot air for an hour, and you don't know any more when they're done than when you did. And uh, But anyway, this is what he says here. We'll read one sentence on page 388 of Earth Shifting Crust. He said, at some point below the crust, a weak layer exists that will permit the displacement of the crust over it. And I'll just demonstrate here, it's a very simple proposition. Basically, what Mr. Hapgood said is this, and I just happen to have a couple bowls here that are identically shaped like the earth. How handy. Now, basically, if this would represent the earth, and that's not a bad representation of a little... Uh, flat deal there, but anyway, the top layer of the hold crust... It up, hold it up a little higher, David. Okay. Here. The, the top layer of the crust of the earth is the hard layer. It's called the lithosphere. And basically what Mr. Hapgood said, that underneath the hard layer, there's a soft layer. And when force is exerted, that the top layer just turns. So this is what we're talking about, the shifting of the earth crust. There's a hard layer, a soft one underneath. When the right, a strong enough force hits it, 
it just turns. And this is literally what would be uh, spoken of in Revelation 6.14. The mountains would move. And like where we're at here in Tell City, Indiana, after the, the crust would shift, we would be somewhere else. And this would be true of everywhere on the earth. And we're going to be example, uh, examining this. And uh, it's really a quite simple theory and it explains so much and as I find with everything that the truth is always in the simplicity and the things that are so complex you can't understand them you know somebody's trying to sell you some snake oil now here's another one of Mr. Hapgood's book uh, books it's called the path of the pole it says here a foreword by Albert Einstein and in the back I want to read just a little bit from Albert Einstein's letter. He's got in the back some of the correspondences that he made with Albert Einstein while he was writing these books. And this is from Albert Einstein to Mr. Hapgood. He says, Dear Mr. Hapgood, I thank you very much for the manuscript that you sent me on May 3rd. I find your arguments very impressive and have the impression that your hypothesis is correct. One can hardly doubt that significant shifts of the crust of the earth have taken place repeatedly and within a short time. The empirical material you have compiled would hardly permit another interpretation. And I think that is absolutely correct. There's hard, uh, real scientific evidence for pole shift. And we're going to be talking about how that's determined throughout the broadcast. Now, as I said, here we got, uh, we'll have it again. We got a hard layer on top and underneath it, we have a soft layer. Now, what force, and we're talking about something pretty strong, what is going to cause that crust to shift. Well, I think we have the answer right in the Word of God. Let's look at some scripture. In Nahum chapter 1, beginning in verse 5, the mountains quake at him. We're talking about the Father. And the hills melt, and the earth is burned at his presence the world and all that dwell therein, who can stand before his indignation and who can abide in the fierceness of his anger. His fury is poured out like fire and the rocks are thrown down by him. In a previous Midnight Ride, we examined much evidence from scripture and from history and from traditions from all over the world of tremendous cosmic disruptions at the time of the Exodus. And we're going to see that from science that there have been three major pole shifts, and we're going to be relating those to Scripture. And here's another one in Habakkuk 3 and 10. The mountains saw thee, and they trembled. The overflowing of the water passed by. The deep uttered his voice and lifted up his hands on high. The mountain saw, saw who? We're talking about Yah. When Yah come in, comes into the first heaven, things start to shake and bake. And I believe this is exactly the force when the Father came into the third, into the first heaven. This, and we're going to look at another factor also biblically, the combination of those is what causes this pole shift. Here's another scripture, Micah chapter 1, verse 3 and 4. For behold, the Lord cometh forth out of his place and will come down and tread upon the high places of the earth and the mountain shall be molten under him and the valley shall be cleft as wax before the fire and the waters that are poured down upon a steep place. Now, let's go back to the path of the pole and we're going to look here on page 320, and John, whenever you want to, just jump in here. You know, you don't need my permission. <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm listening, man. I'm listening, listening. This is okay. an interesting topic. I've been reading the same exact books you've been reading. Thanks. You got me the books, and then we've both been reading them, so this is definitely uh, just it's nice to sit and listen to this. It stuff. is, and I think this could very well segue. There's so many concepts here that are foundational. When we lay precepts here, these are going to open up to a lot of understanding. Now, on page 320 on Path of the Pole by Hapgood, he talks about 
the three North Poles. Did you know that we've had three North Poles before this one? And as John is going to show you on a slide, that our North Pole is now moving at an alarming rate. This is something you'll probably never hear anywhere but on the midnight ride. But we're going to show you the scientific evidence that the North Pole is moving and at an alarming rate. Something is going on, and this is a real way to gauge it. But I'll read a little bit from page 320 of The Path of the Pole by Mr. Hapgood. He said, The general evidence for displacements of the lithosphere. Now, the lithosphere is what they call the outer hard crust of the Earth, or my top paper bowl, either way you want to put that. The general evidence for the displacements of the lithosphere is exceedingly rich. In turn, the assumption of such displacements serves to solve a wide range of problems such as the causes of the ice age, warm polar climates, mountain building. It provides a mechanism that may account for changes in the elevation of land areas and in the topography of the ocean floors. It also provides a basis for the resolution of conflicts in the isotatic theory. And this does, it just, this simple little concept, it just explains a lot of stuff. It goes on to say, the theory permits the construction of of a chronology of polar shifts with three successive tentative polar positions in the Yukon, the Greenland Sea, and Hudson Bay. So before the North Pole is where it is now, it was at one time in the Yukon, at one time in the Greenland Sea, and in one time in the Hudson Bay. Now, how do they know that? And it's a very simple proposition that he goes into in great detail in his books. And I'll try to just give you the truncated, simple explanation. And it is very simple. When you have a compass and the needle on the compass points toward the North Pole, it is because it is magnetized. Now, rocks serve as compasses. And when you have a rock that has metals in it, those little metals in the rock will go right and it'll point toward the pole. And there are lots of old rocks that don't point to our North Pole. There's a bunch of rocks that point toward the Greenland Sea, a bunch of them that point toward the Yukon, and uh, a bunch of them that point toward the Hudson Bay. So by this simple evidence that is just hard scientific evidence, there have been three different poles. Now we can find, and there's more, there's more evidence that can be uh, accumulated on top of that to build. And just like Mr. Einstein said, he said, you know, the case you lay out in this book, you know, there's no other uh, interpretation for this. And, you know, as is often said, the simplest answer is the best. And this is the simple, straightforward answer from science. And we'll see that this does absolutely line up with the Word of God in an amazing way. And it answers a bunch of, bunch of stuff. And it opens up so many paradigms of explanation to where we're going to see a lot of answers come that this will probably segue into other broadcasts that we'll do here to fully, or not fully, but at least explore these bunny trails a little more. Now, there's a slide here that John is going to speak to that is, this is disturbing. And, you know, it's not disturbing in the sense that, wow, I'm afraid we're going to die because we all, we are all going to die. But in the Lord, we don't have to be afraid. But this is amazing. Just speak to this slide here, John. Okay, so I'm just going to show it to you. This is basically just the path of the magnetic North Pole. So you have the, the gray dot, which is geographic North Pole. Uh, which is what we would all consider the North Pole, and that never moves. But then you have this magnetic North Pole, pole that's moved from Canada uh, all the way through to Siberia, it crossed the international date line, and it's moved 1,400 miles since they started tracking it in 1831. So, you know, I'm not an expert, David, on magnets by any means, but I have, I've, you know, obviously try to do my fair share of research on magnetism. But I do know that when you move magnets, and there's other things that are around it that are magnetized. It creates some kind of either sucking everything towards it or pushing things away. And yeah. so I'm interested to see what could happen here. Obviously, 
there's a lot of theories on it. I've heard people say it could be literally could uh, completely shift the shelf, the shelf of the floor, ocean floor up and move everything else down. I've seen uh, tectonic plates where they have the idea that the tectonic plates are going to separate, causing water to be in certain areas or, or drop. Uh, I've seen all that stuff. And if you look at the Atlantic seafloor, it looks like this, there's this crustal plate. It looks like it's almost just a complete rip. And then you have these seafloors of the continents next to it to where it looked like that actually was the land at one time and this other stuff rose up. So uh, I'm, I'm excited to see where you go with this. I know Hapgood, uh, what a brilliant person, first off. He's the one that wrote the Ancient Sea Kings yeah. book, am I right? Yeah, oh, yeah, showed... the maps of the Ancient Sea Kings. Yep. We're going to be showing you a couple of these that are amazing. It's it's mind-blowing. And this uh, what this figures to about seven miles a year. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. I mean, the North Pole is moving it's moved 1400 miles and seven miles a year and what this tells us as we go deeper into analyzing the the reasons behind this that something is going on in the heart of the earth and we're going to be looking at uh, just what these are but this is amazing things are going on that could really really affect things can big I, time can i too also sure. like suggest something because i know the people are going to ask like how in the world can poles shift on on a flat earth or anything like that so the magnetic poles aren't what what you may have been led to believe in a lot of people think it's a pole that goes all the way through the earth and moves it's like that but it's actually according to everything that that they've been able to study it's like a motion of of some kind of metal underneath the underneath the earth it's a motion that moves fluidly through the earth and so it's not like it's not the same as what we've been taught and, and anyways i don't even know who's who's taught i didn't learn anything about it in school about the poles i mean you just you're just told there's a north pole and there's a south pole and that's pretty much it so the more you study it the more you realize that it's very possible for it to move and, and even if, no matter what model you look at whether you look at a globe or a flat uh, model magnetism moving through an earth and uh, moving has has everything it, it really does matter it really can shift things especially if like what david's saying and what charles hapgood's saying is to where the top um plate like david showed is movable right it's not set in stone so to speak you know it can be moved so that's that's what we're talking about plus you know there's a observable magnetic force coming from the sun as well and a lot of the scriptures that you probably aren't even, I mean, there, you could bring up hundreds of scriptures probably oh, yeah. that have to do with this stuff, but we have verses in scripture where the sun is going to be removed. The first book, uh, verse you read, the stars are rolled back in the sky like a yeah. scroll. So yeah. we're going to have a, something's major going to happen. And I think in scientific terms, that's the best explanation they can come up with for yeah. what's going to take place. So And what Mr. Hapgood said, and this is what all the bright light scientists say, they have to admit that what we know about the inside of the earth is nothing. It's all theory. But we're going to see that the Bible does know some things about it. So we're going to be looking at what the scripture says. And there's other uh, very compelling theories about magnetism that we could ex possibly get into deeper in future broadcasts. And uh, as some that they believe, and I would be inclined to believe this. We've talked about the, the, the portal at the North Pole relating it to Mount Meru and a lot of scriptures in Enoch, that it is quite possible that completely through the earth there would be like from one pole to another that they're connected by a portal and that this is one of the causes why the poles are cold and why we have this uh, magnetic uh, presence there at the pole but these are just more compelling things that uh, we could very well explore in the future now how does this relate to scripture we're going to see if we can find three instances of pole shift in the word of god now let's look at jeremiah chapter 4 verses 23 and 24 i beheld and lo i beheld the earth and lo it was without form and void. That word void is 8414. It's the word tohu. And the heavens, and they had no light. I beheld the mountains, and lo, they 
trembled, and all the hills moved lightly. The mountains were shaken, and the hills were kind of going skiddly diddly. And always, when I look at a prophetic text, where it's, whether it's in Enoch or in the scriptures, what is the prophet seeing? What is there that can connect what the prophet is seeing with something that we can anchor it to and understand what the vision is? And there is something that we can really anchor this to, and it is that word tohu, which is translated here without form. And uh, it is the same word that we see, and we see the two words Tohu wo bohu, tohu wo bohu, without form and void. And th we see this here in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 2. In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Now there are several times... Uh, throughout this broadcast that I will set the hair on fire of some of our good friends at the Christian Research Institute. And uh, what this will be one of them. Now, they believe that basically God created chaos. And it, this without form and void was what God created. And then he brought order out of chaos. I don't like the sound of that already. But in the Word of God, I believe that in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. And as it says in Deuteronomy, his, He is the rock. His work is perfect. God doesn't make junk. And I believe He made the earth perfect and that through the fall of Satan and the judgment on the original earth, that the earth became without form and void. Now, is there any way we can know? Well, we can know, you know, and we can ask ourselves the question, did the Lord create the heaven and earth as a without form and void mess, or did he create it perfect? Let's go to the scripture, and it tells us, but people don't want to believe it because they have bought in to their preconceived, preconceived ideas by their favorite uh, religious teachers, but you won't ever come to truth like that. And Isaiah 45, 18, for thus saith the Lord, now there's an authority for you. I'm going with this one that created the heavens. The same guy that created it is the guy talking here. All right. For thus saith the Lord God that created the heavens, God himself that formed the earth and made it. He hath established it. He created it, not in vain, Tohu, he formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord and there is none else. He says he didn't create it, Tohu. So if he didn't create it, Tohu, it wasn't created, Tohu. I don't care what our good friends over there at uh, CRI, they'll tell you that uh, people that say that don't believe the earth is a spinning globe, that, you know, uh, you know, we're a little wacky, but, you know, we just have to depart from those folks. Uh, we applaud them for the work they've done on evolution and in other areas, but we just have to depart from them and stand with the Word of God because the Word of God makes a very definitive statement. And believing this definitive statement, this gives us our first instance of the shifting of the earth's crust exactly between Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-2. Yeah, and we, we've talked in so many shows on like the Light of Yaw series, talked about these ancient structures that, you know, judging by their alignments, judging by their architecture in general, just how, how they're built, that they're, they're some that are much older, it seems, than what we know to be human civilization at this point. Uh, whether or not they are or not, we don't know for sure, but they they seem to be, especially looking at the way that some of these buildings are aligned. You know, if, if you're if you're aligned to a pattern in the stars and or the sun, for that matter, and then you're not, um, there had to be something that took place in order to shift. And of course, the the Globers, they are going to say it's a, t a a shift in the tilt of the Earth. There's a tilt shift that takes place, but I think it's more likely that this is our tilt shift right here uh, is actually this pole shift that yeah. moves moves the actual yeah. earth yeah then creating this wobble that they speak of yeah, yeah and I'm, and I'm, some people probably don't know what i'm talking about but 
uh, it's a theory, you know, based on yeah. why that there's differences in locations on certain things. Yeah. And some of our listeners probably don't understand when you say Globers. Right. But John means globe heads. That's what he's talking about. So, <laughs> no, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that. I mean, no, I, he like, would, I'd say that. He no, would. I John wouldn't say that. I, I, think, I think that I, obviously that there's some people that are going to hear what we have to say and think we're nuts. And I was the kind of person that would have heard that the first time and think, man, this guy is plum crazy so i you know i get it you know i get that there's people that just aren't going to be able to sure. uh, grasp onto what we're saying and i don't think and that know, doesn't mean they're yeah. all bad no 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 not all bad some of them just are some of them are bad. angry though i'll tell you oh well, yeah yeah some angry. Of them get real angry not and, all of them and we them. don't get angry no and uh all fussed up with our friends that don't believe that but yeah. we do challenge you to when you stand on just what the bible says you don't come out with what some of our friends do but that's another another broadcast but let's look at path of the pole by hapgood and let's look at page 235 and we're going to talk about something else that is extremely compelling sunken continents there have there's and i'll just read what mr hapgood said there is an extraordinary contradiction in the very fact that while continents are supposed to have been permanent. Nearly all the sedimentary beds that composed them were laid down under the sea. Now what that means, and well I'll just read the rest of this, there is no denying the fact, it's just a fact that if you study the the, the ground and, uh, and the layers in North America, it used to be at the bottom of the sea. He goes on to say, uh, according to Humphreys, the sea has covered as much as 4 million square miles of North America at one time. And you can prove that with Asia, with Africa. And this would be just what we would expect if the continents were in one place and the crust of the earth shifted and they were somewhere else. And all through the legends of every people group on earth, it doesn't matter where they are, how old they are. There are these legends that people believe, and I believe it. You believe it. We uh, there's Atlantis, there's Lemuria, there's Mu. These legends of these sunken continents, and we can find so much evidence of that. There's so much uh, evidence and fascinating things we could bring about underwater things that found under the water amazing things but it is a fact that and i absolutely believe that the 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 legends that we would attribute to atlantis lemuria and mew these were all at one time above the earth and basically the the land above the earth now was at one time underwater and this as mr hapgood said is an undeniable scientific fact and basically everything that's underwater was at one time above and this idea that so many people believe and i believe it too of these sunken continents and ancient civilizations this is his absolute scientific fact and once again can we find it in scripture and yes we can and this will show us our second instance of pole shift and we'll find this, uh, let's go to the book of the prophet Ezekiel, chapter 27, and we're going to read verses 32 through 36. And it speaks of the judgment of Tyrus. And in their wailing, they shall take up a lamentation for thee, and lament over thee, saying, What city is like Tyrus? like the destroyed in the midst of the sea. When thy wares went forth out of the seas, thou fillest many people, thou didst enrich the kings of the earth with the multitude of thy riches and of thy merchandise. In the time when thou shalt be broken by the seas in the depths of the water, thy merchandise and all thy company in the midst of thee shall fail. All the inhabitants of the isle shall be astonished at thee, and their king shall be sore afraid. They shall be troubled in their countenance. The merchants among the people shall hiss at thee. Thou shalt be a terror, and never shalt be any 
more. I want to read the description in um, Daniel Block's in Daniel Block's commentary here of this. I love the way he describes it. Uh, he says of this passage, he says, All of Tyre's wealth and all her noble sailors will sink with her. The people on the mainland are aghast, and the sailors on board other ships are horrified at the sinking of this Tyrannian Titanic. And this is exactly what's described in the book of Ezekiel, the city of Tyre going down just like the Titanic. And what is compelling in the history of mankind, which goes back Far before, we have a continuous historical record way back, even before Alexander the Great Nebuchadnezzar. The city of Tyre fell to Nebuchadnezzar. It fell to Alexander the Great. And this is one of the most amazing uh, engineering feats in uh, in the ever done. And we've talked before about Alexander being a Nephilim. But he built... The, the city of Tyre was on an island that was off of the sea, and it was believed to be unconquerable. And Alexander built a causeway from the land to the sea, and he went over it, and he had it almost done, and the people from Tyre came out and destroyed it. He rebuilt it again, went in there, and took the city. He was a very determined fella. But the point being, nowhere in the history of mankind did Tyre ever sink like a rock, or did it? We are looking at something that happened before the historical destruction of Tyre by Nebuchadnezzar and Alexander the Great. So where might we find the answer? Well, maybe we've got the clue right here in the Word of God. Let's look at Ezekiel 28 and 2. Son of man saying to the prince of Tyrus, Thus saith the Lord God, because thine heart is lifted up, and thou hast said, I am a God, I sit in the seat of a God, in the midst of the seas, yet thou art a man, and not God, though thou set thine heart as the heart of God. And this guy was in the middle of the sea. Now here we have the prince of Tyrus, and now in verse 12, the scripture begins to address the king of Tyrus. Now, we've got another character here, the king of Tyrus, and we'll see what the Word of God says about him. Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, Thou sealest up the sum, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Thou hast been in Eden, now, here, we have to either believe the Bible or believe what we're told. You know, when I was in Sunday school, I was told that in the Garden of Eden, we had the tree, we had the apple, we had Adam and Eve, and we had the snake. I wasn't told about no other stuff, but there was other stuff there according to the Bible. So we're going to have to expand our concepts here to believe Scripture if we're going to get this, or if not, you know, we can just stay where we're at. But it says that this guy was in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering, the sardis, topaz, and the diamond, the barrel, the onyx, and the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle, and gold, the workmanship of thy tabrets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou wast created. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created till iniquity was found in thee. And this is the second instance, and I believe when the king of Tyre, that his empire fell, to the bottom of the sea, that this was at the fall of man in the Garden of Eden. And this is exactly what Ezekiel 27 is talking about, because this is nothing that has happened within the historical record of mankind. Well, right here in 28, we had the king of Tyrus in Eden, and this is the ancient kingdom of the kingdom of Tyrus that was in Eden, that we see literally the whole thing going under. And it was because... There was a flood and a pole shift at the fall of man. So we've got two. We've got one between Genesis 1, 1, and 2. We've got one at the fall of man. And let's just ask ourselves the question, is there any other scripture 
that we could bring forth or other testimonies to a flood in the Garden of Eden at the time of the fall of man. And there absolutely are. Now let's read some more texts. Do you have something you want to say, John, before well, we roll on? I just want to add a couple more scriptures to the, the tire flooding just real quickly. Ezekiel 26, I don't think you have one of those. Do you have any? Ezekiel I don't think 26? we do anything okay, from chapter so 26. I'm going to read 26, 18 through 19. It says, Now shall the isles tremble in the day of thy fall. Yea, the isles that are in the sea shall be troubled at thy departure. For thus saith the Lord God, when I shall make thee a desolate city like the cities that are not inhabited, when I shall bring up the deep upon thee, and great waters shall cover thee. And you have Ezekiel 26, uh, 21. It says, I'll make thee a terror, and thou shalt be no more. That, though thou be sought for, sought for, you shall never be found again, saith the Lord. And there's more, like Ezekiel 26, 3-5. It says, Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I'm against thee, O Tyrus, and will cause many nations to come against thee, and the sea causeth his waves to come up. And they shall destroy the walls of Tyrus and break down her towers. I will scrape her dust from her and make her like the top of a rock. It shall be a place for the spreading of nets in the midst of the sea. For I've spoken it, said the Lord God, and it shall become a spoil to the nations. And, and when you said Atlantis there, I'm like, man, that is dead on yeah. Atlantis. It is Atlantis for yeah. sure. Yeah, I think even Plato might have connected that dot, if I remember correctly. Uh, because if you look at look at Tyre first off, that's where all the mysteries come from. That's where Freemasonry, all of yeah. these different mysteries of Jezebel, Jezebel, all of that stuff comes from there. Jezebel was the she was the princess of Tyre who married the king of Israel. Yeah. I mean, this is where all of that comes yeah. from for sure. Oh, Interesting. Yeah. Just wanted yeah. to yeah, and uh, Hiram of Tyre, Freemasonry, yeah, big 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 deal here. Yeah, and just like John was reading there from Ezekiel twenty six. I read a scripture from 27 and then 28. Well, what does this all mean? Oh, the king of Tyrus in the Garden of Eden. Yeah, he was pretty good till he was iniquity found in him. And we had to deal with him. And there he goes under the water. And as I said before, uh, are there other scriptures and other texts that we can bring to bear that would give us evidence of a flood of the Garden of Eden at the fall of man? And there is. Now, let's go to uh, Ezekiel 31 and 3. And let's look at this other scripture, and this is the guy I always say, this guy's invisible. I think me and John's the only ones that can see him. Everyone else out there never talks about him. They can't see this guy here, but let's see if you can see him. Ezekiel 31 and 3, Behold, the Assyrian was a cedar in Lebanon with fair branches, with a shadowing shroud, and of an high stature, and his top was among the thick boughs. Now, we just read in Ezekiel 28, where the king of Tyrus was in the Garden of Eden, that he was a cherubim. Now we see the Assyrian was there too. Well, are we going to believe this or are we going to, you know, this is poetry. And you know, it's amazing. I love to read Bible commentaries and it's amazing how many guys just skip this. You know, we don't know what to do with that. And with the paradigm that we've been given from the church and from secular history and from science there's no place to put this in but the word of god says it's here so let's start with the bible and let's work everything into it we come up with some amazing stuff but the bible says that the uh the king of tyrus and the assyrian were in the garden of eden now let's read on it says in 31 8 and 9 the cedars in the garden of God could not hide him. The fir trees were not like his boughs, and the chestnut trees were not like his branches, nor any tree in the garden of God and was like unto him in his beauty. I have made him fair by the multitude of his branches, so that all the trees of Eden that were in the garden of God envied him. Now there's more trees there, and we've got some symbolism here of, of trees representing uh, these angelic powers now let's read this one it, let's see if we can see a flood here ezekiel thirty-one fifteen. thus saith the lord god in the day when he went down to the grave and this mosquito here is about to go down to the grave <laughs> i caused a mourning and it's speaking of the assyrian it thus saith the lord god in the day when he went down to the grave i have caused a mourning i covered the deep for him I restrained the floods thereof, and the great waters were stayed. And I looked that up as, as much I could in the Hebrew, and what that looks like, you know, if you've ever been out 
with the holes uh, when you were a kid or maybe I was doing this just a couple days ago. But if you ever have a hose and it's uh, the water's coming out and you try to put your hand over it and it just squirts everywhere. This mm -hmm. is what this means. Only the father could stop it. He was strained the waters. It was a flood, but he it flooded Eden, but it didn't flood the entire uh, earth as it did in the times of Noah. But it says right here, I restrained the floods thereof, and the great waters were stayed, and I caused Lebanon to mourn for him, and all of the trees of the field fainted for him. So at the fall of man, we had uh, the, and it describes the fall of the Assyrian in Ezekiel 31, just like we see the fall of Lucifer, and as Lu Satan one time fell in before Genesis, uh, after Genesis 1 1, and between Genesis 1 2. Now, let's see if we can have another witness, and we do have an, another amazing witness to the flood in the Garden of Eden from what's called the Little Genesis, the Book of Jubilees. Now, let's read this text in the Book of Jubilees, chapter 4, beginning in verse 22. And he testified to the watchers, and here uh, the author of Jubilees is speaking of Enoch. And he testified to the watchers who had sinned with the daughters of men, for these had begun to unite themselves so as to be defiled with the daughters of men. And Enoch testified against them all. And he was taken from amongst the children of men, and we conducted him into the Garden of Eden. We did a Book of Enoch episode about the moving of the Garden of Eden. That was a, that was a classic. But it goes on to say, We conducted him into the Garden of Eden in majesty and honor, and behold, there he writes down the condemnation and judgment of the world and all the wickedness of the children of men. And on account of it, God brought the waters of the flood upon all the land of Eden. Well, looky there, it's right there, that the land of Eden was flooded, and I believe this took place exactly at the time of the fall of man. And there's so many things here, but in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 28, it says that uh, the go forth and multiply. Genesis 6 and 1 said that uh, when, uh, the, that when uh, well, let me just read it because I want to get it just right, because there's a direct reference here in uh, Genesis 6 and 1 to Genesis uh, chapter 1 and verse 28. And um, in Genesis chapter 6 and verse 21, there's timing here. You see, I always look for timing. We want to know when the author is speaking to, what's he seeing, what's the time frame. And in Genesis chapter 6 and verse 1, the text says, And it came to pass when there's your timing and it came to pass when man began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born unto them that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair when did this start when men begin to multiply well when did men begin to multiply we see it right here uh, in Genesis chapter 128, on the sixth day, and God blessed them and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply. Right there it is. And the Bible says when they begin to multiply on the sixth day, that's when it happened. And that was what caused the flood to be upon Eden at the fall of man. We had another incursion, Enoch chapter 6, 200 come down uh, on, the, uh, on Mount Hermon. And the story was continued. But this is an amazing witness to confirm with uh, Ezekiel 31 and 28 that we did indeed have a flood upon the earth at the time of the fall of man. Hmm. And the connection, too, that, you know, I just, and this is kind of probably not, you know, doesn't go with the whole thing, but the connection between Ezekiel 27 and Revelation 18 is pretty unreal. You know, it talks about basically the old Atlantis versus the new Atlantis. And you want me to read those two? Sure. In, in, yeah, in, sure. In Absolutely. It says, um, let me get it open here. It says, and in their willing, they shall take up a lamentation for thee. This is in Ezekiel. Uh, over thee saying, what city is like Tyrus, like the destroyed in the midst of the sea? When thy wares went forth out of the seas, thou fillest many people. Thou did enrich the kings of the earth with a multitude of thy riches. 
riches and I merchandise. And this is Revelation 18. It says, For in one hour so great riches has come to naught. Every shipmaster and all the companies and ships and sailors, as many as trade by sea, stood afar off and cried when they saw the smoke of her burning, saying, What city is like unto this great city? And we've talked about this whole New Atlantis concept, the idea behind the um, the occultists, I guess, in general, the Rosicrucians and all them, the, the idea, the Templars, the, about this New Atlantis that'll come forth and be a science state. And, and a lot of people don't really even know what Atlantis is. You know, probably a lot of our listeners know what it is. But the, the, the whole concept behind this place is it was full of science, full of magic, full of wizardry, full of riches, full of beauty, full of, and, and it had powerful kings that were a part of it. And, and we see those kings resurface in Revelation with the ten horns on the yeah. on the dragon because yeah. there was ten kings of Atlantis. Yeah. So, Yeah, this ten king concept, like John said, it's all through the scripture. It's all through uh, occult lore. It's huge, and it begins right here with Atlantis. So mm -hmm. we, we, we understand these things just by believing Scripture. Now here we have, uh, let's read this text. And this sounds, this is speaking to the fall of the Assyrian. Now here's another concept we're going to understand that contributes to the force. Like we've got a hard crust of the lithosphere, then underneath it we have a soft layer. And it says in many Scriptures, that when the Father came into the first heaven in times of judgment, that literally the mountains moved. And there's another concept we're going to explore here. And all of these scholars admit that they know nothing about the inside of the earth. It's all theory. And uh, you go uh, beyond more than what the electric company can dig a hole uh, that's about all they know. There's just not much is known. But let's look at some scripture. Ezekiel 31, 16. I made the nations to shake at the sound of his fall, speaking of the Assyrian, when I cast him down to hell. Now, what I conclude from that is that hell is down. With them that descend into the pit, descend. So hell and the pit are down and all the trees of Eden, the choice and the best of Lebanon, all that drink water shall be comforted in the nether parts of the earth, which means the lower parts of the earth. So we've got a lot of stuff going down into the center of the earth. And we're going to show that there are other scriptures that even speak of hell expanding and in these times of judgment and just a very simple explanation that there were so many spiritual entities fallen beings and human beings being cast into hell the bible speaks of entire armies being cast into hell and that there literally was so many thousands and thousands and millions of people that literally hell got bigger. And this also contributed to the force that was exerted on the, the crust of the earth to cause it to shift. It says in verse 17, they also went down into hell with him unto them that be slain with the sword and they that were his arm that dwell under his shadow in the midst of the heathen. Genesis 10, 25. Now here is another very, very compelling scripture. And this would take us to the time frame of about a hundred years after the flood. And this is another instance of pole shift. We've got between Genesis 1, 1 and 2, we've got the fall of man that we see recorded in Genesis 3. And also, uh, here's a big one, Noah's flood. And this is about 100 years after Noah's flood. In Genesis 10, 25, it says, And unto Eber were born two sons. The name of one was Peleg, for in his days was the earth divided, and his brother's name was Joktan. Now, what many people in seminaries today tell us, well, this was referring to the dispersion of the nations at the Tower of Babel. That's not what it says. It says the earth was divided. So I believe it means the earth was divided. Now, 
And Peleg itself means like river or stream, so basically a division of land there. So Peleg is name alone. They said they named him Peleg because this happened, and that makes sense because yeah. it is a division of land. You know, yeah. and most most borders are dependent on water to bo divide the land. So interesting. It is. Now let's go back to, and this is Adam Clark's commentary, and let's see what Brother Clark says on this text, and I think he's pretty much right here. He says that there, though some are, are of the opinion that a physical division and not a political one is what is intended here, a separation of continents and islands from the mainland, the earthy parts having been united into one great continent previously to the days of Peleg. This opinion appears to me to be the most likely for what is said, verse 5, is spoken by way of anticipation. Well, let's just read verse 5. And uh, in Genesis chapter 10 and verse 5, it said, By these the isles of the Gent excuse me, by these were the isles of the Gentiles divided in their lands, everyone after his tongue, after their families and their nations. So does that mean that the islands were really divided? Well, maybe that means the islands were really divided and that the earth was divided. I think this is exactly what Scripture is telling us. And this, if we understand the concept of the shifting of the crust and pole shift, and if we understand the forces that were at work here, it makes poifix sense. It really does. Now, let's read in the Genesis record. Now, here again, I'm going to uh, agitate some of our good friends that believe in the young earth, and uh, I believe in a young earth, but just not as young as they do. And uh, in uh, the modern young earth movement, it is so unfortunate that there are still some that want to cling to a 4004 date for the creation of everything. And I'm going to read from the Genesis record by Henry Morris. Henry Morris was the father of the young earth movement. He was a smart guy. And uh, in his book, the Genesis record, and we're talking about the guy that started the whole movement that become the creation uh, science Institute, the ark over there, uh, the whole thing. This is the guy that started the entire movement. And in his book here, the Genesis record, he admits that the creation of Adam and Eve could be as far back as 10,000 BC. And that when we get to the flood and back that of uh, Mr. Usher's dates are off by 5,000 years or even more. The reason for this is that there are gaps in the genealogies. And this is not that the Bible is not written correctly or is in error, but the genealogies, they are there to show us the seed of the woman, the seed of the serpent, the bloodline of the Messiah. There's a lot you can learn from them genealogies, but they are not a continuous record like every one in that line is not there. And Mr. Morris in the Genesis record, he goes into detail showing where many of these gaps are. So I'll just read what Mr. Morris said. So it's sad when people want to fight and argue and there are people that will put people in hell if they don't believe everything was created in 4004 BC. And that's so unfortunate. And it is really not too bright because even the father of the young earth movement would not agree with you. Let's read what he says here. On This is on page uh, 45 of the Genesis record. He said, many writers have argued that one or more gaps of unknown magnitude may be assumed in these lists, especially in Genesis 11. This possibility will be discussed later in the commentary on these chapters, and he goes into detail, pointing where they're at, and they're there. In any case, they cannot be stretched sufficiently to accommodate modern evolutionary chronology, and I agree with him wholeheartedly there, which places the origin of modern man at about 3000 BC rather than 4000 BC. At the outside, it would seem impossible to insert gaps totaling more than about 5,000 years in these chapters without rendering the record irrelevant and absurd. Consequently, the Bible will not support a date for the creation of man 
earlier than about 10,000 B.C. And I think he is very, very close to the truth. Now, I will also say, where as I explained earlier, so what we have, we have many in the Young Earth Movement that would disagree with the founder of it and with the obvious evidence of Scripture. And number two, I would depart from these these gentlemen, in that I would believe that there is a gap between Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-2, as I explained earlier in the broadcast. But we need to, we need to think a little bit here, because uh, there's some things here that people are believing that obviously are not correct, as we find in so many instances. And and even even if the so even if the only geological record we have is let's say historically we can look at people that have been writing the civilizations for let's say six that seven thousand years, by no means does that mean that the Earth is that old. You know, it just doesn't mean that. I mean, we always, I think as as humans, we always like to do that with our mind. Well, if this is true, then this has to be true. Then this has to be true. But it's not always the case. You're it's right. not. It's That's really exactly just right. not always the case. Sometimes. There are things we just don't know. We don't. We're not going to know. I've I've studied history enough to know lately, David, especially in the last two years, that most of it is falsified. A lot of it is written by people that are trying to uh, discredit this or that, or make themselves yep. look good versus their enemies. And so we have little to go on besides the scripture. That's why I love that we go into this because really, if we can't trust the scripture, we can't trust anything. But this is what we choose to trust, That's and based exactly on right. its history. Um, that's all we can do. But I mean, people are very dogmatic about this subject. I know that I'm going to receive emails from people that are just irritated and mad that you would even think that there's any kind of gap in between this or that. But the fact is there is no way to 100% be 100% definitive about any of it. Now we, we do look at it and there is evidence that has happened. I mean, I, I think that there's more evidence that there was a gap then there is evidence that there wasn't. I, oh, yeah. I really do believe that. Oh yeah. And here again, this makes sense of so much. When you when you take the Bible for what it says, things fall in line with our hard, real, true scientific evidence that we know it just fits perfectly because the Bible is correct in everything that it says. Mm -hmm. Now, as we said earlier, that as far as what's deep in the heart of the earth, it's total theory. There are no hard scientific evidence that uh, we can know, but the Bible does know. Now let's look at Amos 9.2. I already referred to other scriptures in the book of Ezekiel, which speaks of the abyss and shoal being down. Amos 9.2, though they dig into hell, thence shall mine hand Take them, though they climb up to heaven, thence will I bring them down. Ezekiel thirty one fourteen, to the end that none of all the trees by the waters exalt themselves for their height, neither shoot up their top among the thick boughs, neither their trees stand up in their height. All that drink water, for they are all delivered unto death to the nether parts of the earth in the midst of the children of men with them that go down to the pit. Over and over, the scripture speaks of hell being in the nether and the lower parts of the earth. The Bible knows what's there. Modern science doesn't, and it will remain ignorant because of the rejection of Scripture. Ezekiel 32, 18. Son of man, wail for the multitude. You see, we got a bunch. We've got the multitude of Egypt and cast them down, even her and the, I love this phrase, the daughters of the famous nations. Now, that's a phrase, isn't it? Unto the nether parts of the earth. Yeah, the multitude of Egypt. Shoo! Right down there. With them that go down unto the pit. All over the word of God. That we've got a lot of people going down into the pit. And in Ezekiel 30, we'll read one more. 32, 24. There is Elam and all her multitude round about her grave. All of them slain, fallen by the sword, which are gone down down uncircumcised into the nether parts of the earth which caused their tear in the land of the living yet have they borne their shame with them that go 
down to the pit. Now, let's go back to the flood of Noah. Let's back up about a hundred years before the days of Peleg. This is what happened in the 600th year of Noah's life in the second month, the 17th day of the month. The same day were all the fountains of the great deep broken up and the windows of heaven were open. Now, where's the great deep? I believe it's deep. That's where I believe it is. Now, the word deep can refer to an entity. Now, that's another uh, very worthwhile, enlightening little rabbit trail. The word deep can refer to a fallen entity. The word deep can refer to uh, the vast uh, depths of the oceans and also to subterranean oceans. And the deep can also refer the the great deep means deep, deep. And we're talking about something being broken up deep in the heart of the earth and the windows of heaven were open. So we see literally, I believe that the waters above the firmament, and this is another concept if you don't understand that there are waters below the firmament and above the firmament, that literally the firmament is solid and the firmament was opened and the waters above the firmament were brought down to cover the earth even above the mountains with waters. Now, Isaiah 5.14, Therefore, hell hath enlarged herself and opened her mouth without measure and their glory and their multitude and their pomp and he that rejoiceth shall descend into it. And literally what the Bible said when these masses of people are going into the heart of the earth literally hell gets bigger and when you have the earth and the center of it is expanding this exerts pressure on the surface. This is just easy. So combining the judgment of God, the Father coming down, hell getting bigger, putting pressure on the, the plates of the earth on the top. And uh, John talked about the tectonic plates. The lithosphere, lithosphere is the name for the top hard crust. And the Teutonic plates are part of the lithosphere. And we can have earthquakes and we can have Teutonic plate shift without the whole thing moving. So that's between the difference between uh, an earthquake and the total crust shift. Now, so literally, this is what we got going on. We got hell getting bigger. Hell's a busy place, and it's still pretty busy. I wonder if that's why uh, it's moving about seven. It's moving about seven miles a year, and uh, I wonder if that's why. I think that's part of it, certainly. Yeah, that's an interesting thought to that. And here's another thought that's very interesting, and this happens about the same time, or maybe even earlier, when Noah, and this is again a text in the book of Jubilees, and it's recorded here, and here we see another big uh, bunch of beings going down to hell. It says here, But do thou bless me and my sons, that we may increase and multiply and replenish on the earth, and that thou knowest how thy watchers, the fathers of these spirits acted in my day. And as for these spirits which are living, imprison them and hold them fast in the place of condemnation and let them not bring destruction on the sons of thy servant, my God, for these are malignant and created in order to destroy. Now what was happening after the flood? Can you imagine that, uh, and in the book of Enoch, we can determine that, what we see spoken of in the New Testament as devils, that these are the spirits of the Neph Nephilim and the Rephaim that have died. And these, could you imagine these spirits that came out of some of these first generation Nephilim? They were nasty. And, the bi and they were just totally kicking the tail of Noah and his family. They were just overwhelming them. So Noah prays to the Father, 
Do something about it. Now, here's the rest of the text. And let them not rule over the spirits of the living. Thou alone canst exercise dominion over them, and let them not have power over the sons of the righteous from henceforth and forevermore. And the Lord God bade us to bind all. And the chief of the spirits, Mastema, came and said, Lord, creator, let some of them remain before me, and let them hearken to my voice, and do all that I shall say unto them. For if some of them are not left to me, I shall not be able to execute the power of my will on the sons of men, for these are for corruption and leading astray before my judgment, for great is the wickedness of the sons of men. And he said, let the tenth part of them remain before him, and let nine parts descend into the place of condemnation. So in between the flood of Noah and about 100 years, the days of Peleg, when the earth was divided, according to this text, and I, I, you know, I, just, I believe this is, is accurate. I believe it is. Uh, you can believe it or not. But we have, of the 100% of these disembodied Nephilim spirits, 10% were allowed to stay above the earth, which are now the devils we read about in the New Testament. 90% of them were sent down to the heart of the earth. Now, here's another thought, and here's another place where we uh, take great issue with those that say that we are taking Satan's best punch right now. The biggest and the most powerful devils are now 90% are in the heart of the earth, and they are going to be released along with the rest of these spirits. And we can, if you haven't read Revelation chapter 9, the opening of the abyss, all of this coming out, there will literally, we've only got 10% of them now in the demons and the devils. 90% are about to join forces with them. Mm. And this is exactly what we see uh, in Luke 8.31 in the text uh, of the casting out of the devils. It says, And they besought him that he would not command them to go out into the deep. So this is the place where these entities go when they're cast out. Here's a verse to Revelation 18.2, which obviously reminds me of this. You talked about it being unleashed. It says, And he cried mightily with a strong voice saying Babylon the great is fallen is fallen and has become the habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit so basically like the cage or the or the prison of every foul spirit and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird and this is revelation 18 2 uh, I wonder if this is describing the unleashing of of these um, spirits on Babylon yeah yeah it's uh I feel sad for people that uh, everything that is being taught by the most popular and evangelical Christianity today, well, preacher rapture, you know, you're going to be out of here. Don't worry. Well, once saved, always saved. O obey the law. Eh, you're saved anyway. Don't worry about it. And uh, this thing, well, uh, Satan's bound now, you know, yeah, he's just uh, bound to get you. Satan ain't bound now. They don't have scripture, but they have a lot of cliches over here, over there, over here in the air. You see, everything they're doing is setting people up for the fall. They're setting them up for the kill shot. And that kill shot is, uh, it's coming very soon because we have, like we began with the text in revelation, there's a pole shift coming and you won't miss it. Uh, Another thing, a uh, fantastically interesting portion here, as it all is, from Earth Shifting Crest by Hapgood, he talks about the fact that it is just a fact that Antarctica and also Arctica were once warm. He talks about the proof, and they can prove this from fossils and geology, that the Arctic Ocean was at one time warm and flourishing, and that as Antarctic, I'll just read a little bit of this for you. He said, I have suggested that in very recent time, no more than 10,000 years ago, a large part of Antarctica may have been ice-free. This is uh, around the time when uh, Mr. Hapgood would uh, agree 
or excuse me, Mr. Morris would agree that we could push Noah's flood uh, back into that era. But anyway, goes on. I'll just read a little bit more here. Uh, he said, uh, further evidence is provided by the discovery by British geologists of great fossil forest in Antarctica. They have found the fossils in Antarctica of huge forests that were once there. Antarctica has not always been cold. Why is that? Because it's not always been where it is now. That's why. There has been pole shift. There has been the shifting of the earth crust. And there's another uh, really fascinating aspect of this that this just makes so much sense. There is the great extinctions that we've seen, and we've seen in uh, on page uh, 227 of the Earth Shifting Crust, he talks about the animals that were killed instantly. Uh, he said, uh, Hibben estimates that as many as 40 million animals died in North America alone, and this is, they would project this at about the 10,000 B.C. time, which they would uh, consider the end of the Ice Age, and that's another whole discussion. But he says, many species of animals became extinct, including mammoths, mastodons, giant beaver, saber-toothed cats, giant sloths, woolly rhinoceroses. And I just knocked my book off, John. I'm going to pick my book up here and um, something else I'll read down here. All right. Yeah. I'll, while you're picking up your book, there, I heard you drop it earlier. You got he Dave, for you as you don't know, you can't see, but David's got about twenty books surrounding him right here. So he's 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 uh, going through a lot of different resources here, and this is all stuff that the references are here for any of you that want to see it. I know a lot of people think, oh, they're just talking off the top of their head, but there are resources. We put them up on the screen for those of you that are listening on Spotify or anything like that that can't see. The pictures that we're posting, you can always go to YouTube and check them out or nystv.org to check out these at a later time uh, for your own reference. But you can look through these Charles Hapgood books um, that David has been mentioning tonight. There's a lot of lot of really interesting content. And, you know, uh, Hapgood wasn't just someone that fell off the banana boat. I mean, he was a friend of Einstein's. He was a brilliant, uh, recognized brilliant scientist and today because of the um undeniable evidence there are others out there today that would agree with pole shift and catastrophism it's not the majority because they're drinking the kool-aid but uh, there are those out there that are very intelligent and do just like einstein who had a few smarts himself he said that you know hap good he's straight on there and as einstein put it there's no other conclusion that you can come to, he said, when you look at the evidence, and it is. And when you look at the evidence and you put it together with Scripture, it starts to make a lot of sense. And this is just the beginning of a foundation of many uh, areas that can be pursued. And they're, to me, they're so fascinating because these are the things we want to know about. And I remember reading books when I was young about these mammoths, and this just fascinated me so much and in uh, path of the pole page 264 there's another big section where hapgood talks about the mammoths and he talks about the baraskova mammoth and this was discovered in siberia in 1901 and i'll just read a little bit about this and it says here that this animal was frozen so quickly uh, it, it says here and it and they can prove that it was frozen in the middle of the summer because of the things that it had in its stomach there were 50 pounds of food in this mammoth's stomach and they studied it and there's several pages here uh there's four pages in hapgood's book that analyzes the contents of the stomach of this mammoth and these were undigested he was killed so quickly and frozen so quickly that when he unthawed 
in 1901, the wolves were eating the flesh, and the flesh was preserved so good that it could have been fried and eaten. And in the uh, contents of this animal's stomach, the food was not digested, and uh, it was uh, analyzed, and the details of it are all here in Hapgood's book, and it's just fascinating. But I'll just read this statement. He said, And it was in the middle of this warming trend in Siberia when the climber was climate was warmer there than it is now, and right in the middle of the summer that the mammoth died, and his body was immediately frozen, and somehow or other it remained frozen all through this period. When we have shown through much evidence that the Arctic Ocean was warm and luxuriant, forest were growing along the Arctic coast. The same is true of Antarctica. There were once massive forests on Antarctica. And that is just one fascinating place to think about. So what would explain uh, this? You know, and people wonder all kinds of, you know, what in the world could have done this? Well, what could have done this was pole shift and the moving of the earth crust. That is exactly what could have done that, and I believe that uh, that is indeed the case. Now, we're going to, uh, and I'm going to let John speak to these, because these are, these are off the hook. Now, what we have here, and the other book, I have three books by Mr. Hapgood in my library, uh, Earth Shifting Crust, The Path of the Poles, and The Maps of the Ancient Sea Kings. And oh boy, that's a hootie bob. And we're going to show two of these here, and John's going to speak to these. One is the uh, Orontus Phineas map. Uh, I think it's dated 1532, and also in the 1500s, there's the Pyre Reese map. And John is just going to speak to these a little bit these are fascinating yeah both of these are basically the same map but they're just kind of laid out a little bit differently here but you have this big land mass for the picture on the left there you have this big land mass to the right called terra australis uh, and this is actually what we would call antarctic antarctica today and of course much of this land is not there anymore as you can see uh, that is a huge mass but it goes all the way up to south america you have on this right hand side that's the same mass there this terra australis uh right here this is the same structure here except laid out a little bit differently from a different uh perspective but it goes all the way up to touching south america uh, australia you see the land bridge that was possible there around australia new zealand and all those different areas i mean it's an interesting for sure map and you're right david a lot of these maps show like vegetation they show they show uh, kings and stuff going back and forth in the next map you'll 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 see the drawn out you'll see uh, ships going in and out of the harbor in and out of the the places yeah. in these areas but um and also not only just antarctica but you see the arctic circle lush with vegetation uh you have a country called greenland that's right there by the arctic circle called greenland and i've heard the story that they said that they named it that so that people would think that it was an important place to go and they named the other place Iceland, but I'm tending more now to believe that it's possible that they're actually named it that because at one time it might have been Greenland. You <laughs> it know? might have really. And something else fascinating about the um, the uh, Orontus Phineas map and the Pirate Reefs, Antarctica is shown without ice, and to de and the the chartographers that are the map making people they have shown that. And today, you cannot see the coastline of Antarctica because it's buried under three miles of ice. But they can use radar to actually tell where the land is actually under there. And it corresponds precisely to these ancient maps that show Antarctica without ice. Now, this is amazing. We're talking about maps from the 1500s, and this is the time of the Protestant Reformation. This is when William Perkins, uh, the father of Puritanism, began to preach. We've got the Spanish Armada invading England, and these chartographers were obviously drawing upon much older maps. And this is a hoot, John. Just speak to this here as we uh, wrap the broadcast up. I, I so would love to be able to read the text in this uh, part right here to you guys.
but what we're looking at is is ships approaching uh this landmass and you see uh it looks like it looks like there's almost like a barrier on a one side here i don't know how to explain i don't know how to explain it because maybe a wall yeah there's other maps <laughs> that are very similar to this that show a more pronounced wall that's taking place but it looks like all of the inhabitable area of what we see on these maps is gone now and and how how close was that to Tyrus or Atlantis? I don't know, but it's interesting. All of it is pretty much gone. And that begs the question, uh, what were the, the Nazis going there? What was Swaziland? Why were they going to Antarctica and building bases in yeah. these areas? What was What's going on? Why is there a, a Catholic church that's been visited by Krill and also by the Pope to meet together there in this area? What is, we don't know, you know, obviously we don't know. We have our theories and we know what the Bible says. But this is just interesting. These maps are just, you know, they'll, they'll kind of blow your mind. That that maps of the ancient Sea Kings book, David, it has so many uh, just really interesting maps in it. And, of course, the maps aren't going to be perfect because they're they're mapping with, uh, you know, well, what we're led to believe is inferior skills to the people that would be mapping them today. But they're not that far off. Some of these are way different oh, than what are. we have. They couldn't have been that far off, especially if they're mapping – their course based on these maps. This is how um, merchants traveled be based on these maps, so they wouldn't be that far off. Big yeah. difference. And we're going to be doing a lot more study into these. They're so fascinating. A lot of them, these ancient maps, have Tartaria there. And just like you can see uh, of these old maps that are showing Antarctica without ice, and it's like mm. you see these ships drawn in there, and like they're sailing along a wall there at the bottom yeah. of the earth now. Uh, that would make a lot of sense to some of us folks, wouldn't it? It would, and then we've proven that these maps are interesting. You know, Tartaria is, is in a lot of these maps. This is stuff that that we haven't seen in a long time. So good, good for Hapgood, and, and people think we're trying to promote these guys. We're not. We're they do good work. People, there's people that are mathematicians that do good mathematics work. There's people that do good mapping and historical. Uh, context that are not going to be believers. A lot of times, some of these guys aren't. But you still, in order to see what's going on, you not everybody that has mapped everything is a Christian. I mean, you have to no, look at some no, of these things sure, to kind of get a context sure. for what's going on. So yeah, and Mister Hapgood, uh, as far as I know, I don't know that he was a believer. Don't know there really was. I don't know much about his personal life, but he was certainly a brilliant, honest scientist that was not afraid to put forth a theory based on facts that was outside of the mainstream. And I think he is spot on in the basic uh, thrust of his theory. I think so too. And guess what, guys? If you have a question, you have to join us on the Q&A right after this. And the link is in the description to the Q&A. You can go over there. I hope it is anyway. If not, the link will be in the chat. John will post it in the chat. John's going to come over there and ask some questions for us. But join us over there so you can ask questions, pick our mind, we may not have the answer, but we're at least going to hang out and have a good conversation with you guys. David, what an awesome show. It's always one of my – these topics are just, I mean, my goodness, what, what what's better? I do. I love them, and these are the questions that all people think about. We want to know this stuff, and there are answers to these things in the Word of God where we can make sense of things. So thank each and every one of you once again for coming along on the ride and peeling back these ancient mysteries. But now, it is time for the Pounder's Pound. So on the count of three, forgot about that one. There we go. Hit, the, hit the like button, and oh, if there should be anybody, we know there's probably a few <laughs> that aren't going to like it. How could that be? But if that be the case, you can hit the dislike button. So on the count of three, you hit the like or dislike button. One, two, three, boom. There we go. Thank you guys so much. We'll see you guys next time on the Midnight Ride. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up, rise up, rise up.